Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, depends where you are. Uh, welcome to another uh, webinar in the set of webinars that people are organizing on how the current uh, pande pandemic of uh, COVID impacts the internet. Uh, my name is Vladimir Radunovic. I'll be the, the host of the discussion today and the moderator. And today's focus obviously is on um, security aspects. So we had some discussions already on how this uh, situation impacts the infrastructure, human rights, and there have been quite some um, reports recently in the media as well about the, uh, the threats, specific threats uh, that we are seeing online, particularly as we increasingly move um, online. One of the examples that you can clearly see or, or notice in the media coverage uh, is the, the this, this, this platform that we use today, Zoom. But there were a lot of uh, write-ups about um, some possible flaws in the platform, uh, insecurity, uh, whether there is encryption or not, whether our communications are confidential, whether the data, personal data is protected and, and so on and so forth. Um, of course, we are not going to go much into the discussion about Zoom today. Zoom is a, is a very useful platform now, and uh, we have um, mapped a number of platforms in, in um, project, sort of a project platform that we that we created at ConfTech Lab. Uh, we'll share the link in the chat soon so you can compare different platforms. But Zoom appears to be quite, a, for a reason, quite a easy to use one. But this is just one of the aspects of security which are high in the media these days. There are a lot of other um, updates, information, warnings that we hear. Uh, there are specific types of threats related to COVID, such as uh, social engineering, uh, scam, phishing emails, messages. There were some denial of service uh, and ransomware attacks against the uh, health uh, system, uh, educational system, particularly as, as uh, uh, school goes online uh, now in, in most parts of the world as well. There was even some cyber, cyber espionage attempts against um, VPNs and again phishing emails. But we do record uh, some sort of a unified or more and more unified response to, to these threats by the community. And we'll cover most of that uh, in the next hour. But while I'm introducing the format and what we are going to do today, uh, we'll also run the, the short poll. Uh, so we want to ask you actually, uh, as you move more and more online and your work and your life goes online, um, do you feel cyber safe, cyber safe or do you feel safer and safer, maybe because there are new and new platforms which are more safe for you, learn more and more, or equally unsafe or safe as you did before, or increasingly unsafe because maybe there are more vulnerabilities noticed and so on. While we record your vo votes for some half a minute or something, uh, a quick, uh, well, info, there is already some sort of a summary that my colleagues uh, in Diplo prepared on this topic, particularly on uh, cybersecurity aspects in uh, times of, of the pandemic and the crisis, uh, and they're available on the Digital Watch Observatory. One good coverage was in the, in the last monthly newsletter of the Digital Watch Observatory, which is sort of a special edition, so I encourage you to look at that and you will, you will get the, the link uh, in the chat. Now, what is the outline of today's discussion? Um, ah, here are the results. Uh, as, we, as we speak, so are you, as you move online, do you feel more safe or not? And the dominant answer is equally unsafe as always. That's, that's quite an interesting and I would say a rational uh, response that uh, we shouldn't fall into, into too much of a drama. We should be aware and, uh, and cautious. Uh, there is quite a number still of people which are increasingly unsafe, particularly as we, as we move to the new tools and the completely, um, uh, for some, the unknown environment to some extent. And very few actually think that we feel safer and safer. And I hope maybe that by the end of the webinar with my guests, we might um, raise this percentage and, and at least the hope that in the near future, we might uh, feel more and more safe. Uh, what is the outline of the, of the discussion today? Basically, uh, we'll go through three blocks of questions. Uh, first one is, are the risks increasing? The cyber risks looking into uh, the maybe emerging types of threats, um, the vulnerabilities, and also the type of assets that we have to protect. The second block will be related to who does what, or basically what are the responses by different communities, uh, authorities, um, uh, computer emergency response teams, uh, private sector, civil society think tanks, security professionals, who is doing what and who can do what more uh, as a response. And the third um, sort of a block will be actually um, 
a light crystal ball exercise. We'll uh, open the crystal ball and try to look into what comes day after the COVID crisis uh, ends or, or attenuates at least or goes down a little bit and uh, we, we get back to our normal life more or less. Are we going to be more or less safe or what are the, the possible new threats? The format of this webinar for those of you that are maybe new to our webinars, um, basically we'll have uh, quite an interactive discussion with the, with the panelists that will present in a second. Uh, and uh, you can um, post your comments, questions at any point in the text chat. Uh, my colleague Andriana Gavrilovic will help with um, collecting the inputs, uh, feeding to the discussion, uh, helping me basically to uh, pass the, 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 sum up the questions and pass them to the discuss, discussions. And, uh, and there is also a Facebook stream. So we'll try to collect some of the inputs from Facebook as well uh, and feed into discussion um, uh, as, as we go. Now, my great pleasure to introduce the, the guests of, uh, of today's discussion. And I'll start with, uh, with the lady. It's not that often that in discussions on cybersecurity we have ladies, unfortunately. But I'm really happy that we have uh, Anastasia Kazakova with us. Uh, she's a public affairs manager at Kaspersky. Uh, and for all of you, the, the, the panelists, basically, I uh, apologize in advance if I misspell a little bit or mispronounce your name. So once you start later on, you can, you can uh, let us hear the, the right pronunciation. Uh, next to her, if there is a next to in this virtual space, is uh, Dr. Serge Droz. He's a security lead at uh, Proton Technologies, but he's also a chair of the FIRST, which is a forum of uh, security incident teams uh, around the world and is a security advisor at the ICT for Peace um, uh, organization. Um, to my right, maybe, uh, it's Mr. Stefan, uh, Stefan Dugin. He is the CEO of the Cyber Peace Institute, a recently established uh, uh, organization in Geneva, uh, but he can, he'll definitely mention more uh, as we speak. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, far at the other uh, end of, of, the, of the world, uh, at least to me, I'm based in Serbia, we have Mr. David Koch, uh, who is a commissioner of cybersecurity and a CEO of the cybersecurity agency of Singapore. So you can see quite a geographic diversity from Singapore to Russia, where Anastasia is, to Europe. Uh, I think Stefan is in, uh, in the Netherlands, Serge is in Switzerland, I'm based in, in Serbia. So we are a little bit scattered and I'm sure that the many of you are even more scattered around the world. Okay, um, moving on straight ahead to uh, the first um, basket basically of today's discussion is to what extent um, cybersecurity risks or have the cybersecurity risks, risks actually uh, increased during the, the COVID crisis. Uh, we usually, and when we talk about risks and those that are coming from the security sector, they know uh, that we usually uh, observe risks as a combination uh, of various impacts of vulnerabilities, particularly of products and services, uh, as threats and, and assets. And in, in this illustration, you can get a, a picture of what we are talking about, and we'll run through each of those. Uh, when it comes to uh, the assets, it's actually what we need to protect. Uh, what are these ducklings that, that we need to protect? Usually it is not just the computers, it's more and more the processes, the critical infrastructure, even at some, some uh, um, future, definitely the lives as well. The vulnerability, any sort of a, of a break in these branches that the ducklings are walking over, whether they're in products, in, uh, in a hardware, or in humans. Uh, as we'll see, uh, humans are often the weakest link. And then the threats, the crocodiles uh, which are around. And we know that the, the crocodiles in, in the cyber world can be just anywhere around the world. They can be coming from uh, um, political circles, from criminal circles, from states. Uh, um, there are many, many from terrorist groups. There are many different threats. Uh, and different ways that they, they introduce the threats. And uh, I'll stop there with the introduction and actually start with, with a question on, start first in the opposite direction, start first with the assets. So the question is basically, um, as we suddenly get more dependent on cyberspace and health sector gets, and the, and the, the school sector gets uh, more and more online business as well, what are the critical assets that now we have to protect more and more? And I'll start with David. Um, Singapore is known as, as one of the quite advanced uh, countries in terms of cybersecurity portfolio, the policies and the activities in general. And I know that Singapore is currently just um, maybe these days getting into a more of a lockdown uh, as a state in, in, in fight against the COVID. Uh, so what might be some of the, some of the particular um, assets that we, we need to focus more and, and defend more and more 
in this in this crazy situation of a pandemic. David, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Vlada, and uh, good evening to everybody. It's evening here in Singapore. Um, as uh, Vlada alluded to, we are um, facing much more stringent uh, conditions here in Singapore. We are in what is perhaps a second wave of uh, COVID uh, infections. Um, there was an initial wave which the government uh, and the health authorities did a reasonably good job to control, but uh, there is now a second wave of infections and this has resulted in uh, increased social distancing uh, measures which have been imposed uh, on Singapore. And I think many other countries around the world are facing variations of this, lockdown, uh, restrictions, etc. Now, because of this, this has changed our entire way of living, how we interact, etc. And before we talk about and this has fundamentally changed the kinds of assets which we now have to protect. In the past, what we thought of as critical infrastructure, electricity, telco, etc., um, security, hospitals, uh, these have changed. In the current situation, at least in Singapore, uh, we have new assets which we never thought. Uh, th those remain, uh, the traditional critical infrastructure remain important, need to be protected. But there are new assets which we never thought of as critical. Uh, take, for example, online grocery shopping or online food delivery. As more and more people have to work from home, as we are discouraged from going out, or in some countries we are not allowed to go out, then how do you get your essential supplies? How do you get food? How do you get groceries? Uh, suddenly you have a new class of things which you never thought of as critical infrastructure which in this new context requires you to protect the kinds of uh, platforms which they use were perhaps not designed with security in mind because they were never considered a critical infrastructure. But this has changed things uh, quite significantly. So that's one major change. Um, and of course, secondly, as we move more and more to teleconferencing uh, and meetings like this and using platforms like Zoom, we become much more dependent on the telco and the internet uh, infrastructure. Um, the kinds of demands we have on the bandwidth have also changed and how critical um, the response times are have also dramatically changed. Uh, this puts us much more dependent on this kind of infrastructure uh, and they have also changed, I think, the uh, uh, potential attack surface. So these uh, dynamics have resulted in significant changes and placed new demands on how we look at inf critical infrastructure and how we now deal with this. Um, telecommuting has also uh, changed the way that we interact with one another. Uh, now we now use Zoom and as Vlada has uh, alluded to, uh, there are increasing reports of uh, more uh, vulnerabilities uh, uh, on Zoom and such platforms. How do you deal with this? Uh, do you discourage people? Do you tell people you can't use it? Uh, well, some countries, uh, some companies have done so. Or do you take the risks? So how we manage the risk profile has also changed. If you're running a bank, Traditionally, you will not allow, allow personal data, et cetera, to move out of the office. But if you now have to work from home, how do you continue providing service to your customers? Perhaps you have allowed some backend uh, data, personal data, uh, very um, sensitive data to be brought back home and be accessed from home in order for these services to be continue to be provided. In effect, your risk profile, your risk appetite has changed. The question is, after the COVID situation dies down, do we now recalibrate or do we keep to this heightened risk profile? Uh, some of us may not have actually realized that we have changed our risk profile. So I just stop with this and uh, some of the comments that I have with respect to the changing world that we are facing. Thank you. Thank you, David, uh, and feel free to jump in at any point later on as well, uh, even if, if I don't call upon you. But I think you raised an, a very important question. Whenever we teach or discuss uh, cybersecurity policy and approaches, we usually, of course, talk about critical infrastructure. And each country has its, its own sort of a set of uh, identified critical infrastructures. But it changes from situation to situation. And that's something that's quite interesting here. Uh, and the, 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 um, the example that you mentioned of the grocery stores might be particular for your country, might not be somewhere else where maybe the education is. So I, I wonder, I don't know, Serge, if you want to take over, uh, I, I wonder whether there were any discussions around the third community from different countries, because you are sitting on the top of that to some extent. 
Uh, if there are different concerns about the assets that we have to protect, as, as David mentioned, uh, in different countries, or what is the general sense of, uh, of, uh, of uh, protecting the assets? Serge. So thank you, Vlad. Um, so in, in the instance response community, the, the, the first thought was about, oh, okay, now we have to pay attention to all the healthcare providers and the healthcare affiliated industry. And indeed, we actually do see an increased attack on, on healthcare providers and hospitals. There is talk in the internet on the ground that we can actually now raise the prices for ransoms when we attack hospitals because we know they don't really, they don't really have the time to fill kind of play backups back into the system that rather pay and this is, is considered a big business uh, opportunity. We also had a couple of, uh, of, I think, wrong predictions. For example, a lot of people said, oh, Netflix is gonna, gonna really drain our, our bandwidth and, and the network exhaust the network capacity because everybody's at home watching Netflix and, and taking away bandwidth from critical infrastructure. Netflix actually responded and reduced the bandwidth, but it never really was a topic. And then we have the new things like, as you mentioned, Zoom that, that came out. And it's not that Zoom suddenly has more security vulnerabilities. It's just that people start detecting them. And on a side note, I think Zoom quite responsibly uh, is taking measures to, to fix this. Um, so I think what really changed is, is, is the focus of, of where the attacks go. And, but then when we, in the third community, it's always been clear that the concept of critical infrastructure is a relative one because typically with critical infrastructure, we think of nuclear power plants, we think of, of the communication infrastructure, but then at the end of the day, what do you take to, what does it take to, to damage these? It's usually hacked home computers, it's hacked webcams, like take the Mirai botnet. That was a bunch of cheap webcams that were hacked that took down a large part of the infrastructure. So. I would say as a CSER, you cannot ignore this. You cannot ignore the non-critical part, or in other words, everything is, is critical. And of course the buzzword around that is really cyber hygiene. It doesn't really help you if you have a super secure hospital, if everything around you is really a cesspool. So you have to make sure that you, your basic cyber hygiene is good. You, everybody has to wash their hands uh, to, protect you from Corona. And the same is really true in, in the internet too. And, and that is something that CSIRs have really been at. Right now, what we see is, is indeed a focus of looking at healthcare providers because they are considered critical, but the same goes, goes for kind of the, the supply chain and, and all of these things, as, as David pointed out, so making sure people have enough food on the table. That's today a non-trivial part but has been kind of in, in the critical infrastructure part one way or the other hidden. It's just that most people did not appreciate this. And I remember discussions where, where we discussed about, hey, we have to make sure that, that the trucking companies have good IT infrastructure. And people were kind of looking at us and saying, yeah, sure guys. But now all of a sudden, they start realizing it, it's not a given. And just in time is really hard in times like this. Yeah, thanks, Serge. And uh, I guess the appreciation about uh, of of the various uh, sectors is uh, stands also for the for the health sector, which we usually don't appreciate enough until these things happen. So I guess we'll learn something, uh, unfortunately or hopefully, out of this crisis. Uh, but looking at at um, at the reports, basically, and moving maybe to this crocodiles part of the of the um, threats, there were a couple of uh, uh, summaries on the main threats recorded, and this is just one summary from. Uh, Statista on the uh, specific threats related to, and it's mainly in the spam and the phishing mails related to or having context or content uh, related to COVID-19. Uh, and we can see that uh, the malicious spam emails uh, um, are quite, uh, quite uh, in search, uh, which are related to this, of course, the criminals are using it. Uh, and then the countries which are, which are sort of hit by these type of threats are also interesting to observe. They are mainly the European countries which are under the stress and then the US under the stress of COVID currently. It would be interesting also, David, later if, if you have any, any information on what are the main threats in Singapore. But before that, I wanted to, to check with, um, with Anastasia. Um, since Kaspersky is basically on the top of, of following various uh, threats around, do you have any sort of an update of uh, uh, recorded threats? We've seen a lot about, as, as Serge mentioned, 
a lot about the, the, the attacks against the Brno hospital, the US hospital, uh, some of the medical research centers. There were these reports even of the, I don't know if you noticed that the, uh, the corona antivirus, which allegedly uh, even prevent you from being infected physically from, from uh, corona. And then some of the experts said, uh, no, you can't really install the antivirus and protect yourself from corona. But people basically get, get uh, under this. Uh, now, are there any, any sort of uh, information coming from Kaspersky, uh, Anastasia? Hello to everyone, and um, thanks a lot for having me today. Um, indeed, that is a very good question that uh, Vlada, you raised. I'd like to just probably outline key trends that Kaspersky researchers are currently observing, key shifts in the cyber threat landscape these days because of the COVID-19. So um, even if the number of attacks is roughly the same as it was before, it's still, the number is still significant, but um, what changed what the main change that uh, colleagues are observing this day, these days is an increase in exploitation of the COVID-19 agenda by malicious actors in cyberspace. Among of the, the key ad attack vectors um, uh, Kaspersky identifies are phishing, attacks that are just recently home installed corporate service and ransomware. Social engineering attacks have become easier also uh, during this uh, highly chaotic uh, times because or uh, simply because people fall uh, for simple tricks easier uh, all of a sudden millions of people right now who would be normally out of socializing uh, in bars and restaurants they are being forced uh, to stay at home which means more exposure to the usual risk and uh, remote work actually is a new experience for a lot of people uh, there may have been difficulties just separating what is being considered as personal, what is being considered as a corporate, what is being considered as critical, and then it's clear how corporate security policies would be uh, appropriately ensured while everything being installed at home. Whether data that would store it safely in a corporate network would be, and now is brought back home would be again uh, secured and uh, ensured in terms of the integrity and security. Um, also, I'd like to mention that many actions are now being tested on a hard cock basis. Or some are actions are done in a hurry. There could be some unforeseen uh, mistakes. For example, the rapid adoption of video platforms could lead to create a security risk and it could be an attractive target also for threat actors. And um, then also, though we told in a 2020 predictions report that we actually observe the reduce um, in number of actions in medical organizations. And hopefully it could be some of a good lesson learned after WannaCry. But now we see growing the numbers of targeted APT attacks at uh, medical research institutions and our pharmaceutical companies that conduct innovative researches. And this is something that explicitly being highlighted during this COVID-19 agenda in the uh, cybersecurity. The last two trends that I'd like to also mention is um, the pandemic crisis made privacy concerns again even more acute uh, because um, there are some questions whether appropriate privacy safeguards are applied for using the anonymous data, whether it is good, whether it is still insured, and so on. And lastly, and finally, um, speaking of geographical areas of malware and ransomware, um, proliferation. We observe actually a direct dependence between countries that are, are currently on a lockdown and increase in cybersecurity, uh, cyber criminals activity in that countries. For instance, in our uh, security portal uh, at Kaspersky, it's possible to access the monitoring of different virus infections in different countries. And if you um, or well, someone will check it, you can see the curve is actually rising up in France, in Spain, in Germany, just uh, for the last uh, days and weeks. I, I would stop. I would stop here. Thanks a lot. Uh, and then uh, this this uh, basically confirms again that the criminals are quite organized and informed. And we have seen some of the phishing emails done in Italian and in other languages. So they're really trying to fit into the context. Um, and uh, there were some comments in the chat. We'll get back to Andrena a little bit later uh, with a summary of the comments, but there were quite important comments of uh, perspectives from de developing countries where the, the access to protect may be even further different, like the 
um, the transaction of the of the funds, uh, like in Pesa and Kenya or the others, which are uh, the key way to to um, exchange the money sometimes, or the of course the power infrastructure, which is everywhere critical, but uh, in Africa or elsewhere may be additionally critical and so on. So we always have to try to to keep this uh, uh, this perspective of developing countries as well. Now looking into well, maybe the whole the whole uh, uh, set of uh, components of the risks, so the assets that we need to protect, and then the threats, and then the, the vulnerabilities uh, uh, that that exist now, probably in humans. We'll get back to that, Stefan. Uh, since you, with the, with the, well, with the Cyber Peace Institute, you do a lot now, cover uh, the the threats, uh, but you also, in your sort of previous, uh, you were heavily involved in Europol and working on cyber crime. And from your side on on the trends basically and then how safe we are today in this crisis Stephen. thank you um thank you for inviting us first and uh, very appreciate the, the time spent with the uh, with the other panelists here uh, very interesting insight i will i will build on it if you if you allow in terms of the threat landscape and uh, something that has been mentioned by everyone i guess so far is the fact that uh, what was existing before in terms of the threats in the cyberspace is still a still apply in the context of COVID-19. Uh, one of the highest vulnerability in the cyberspace is human behavior. It has always been like this. And in this context where, in fact, the, the cyber, uh, the, the, the threat landscape in the cyberspace uh, is, uh, is getting, um, is being transformed by an increase of anxiety, by an increase of uncertainty, and with the fact that people are in huge desire to access data. So as in the past, it's not new. It's also interesting to look into what happened before in other similar crises and what we learned, or we did not learn, in fact. Uh, it happened in, uh, in the context of the uh, Ebola outbreak, where there were um, campaign, malicious campaign to impersonate uh, medical uh, capabilities or government agencies in order to abuse the trust of, um, of citizens or companies and to impact them with cyber attacks. It also happened in the, in the context of the Zika outbreak. Um, anything that is triggering emotion, in fact, is a fertile ground for this kind of abuse. You can think of the uh, Charlie Hebdo attack, where even the hashtags were abused, uh, the Je suis Charlie, in order to be sure that a large uh, number of people uh, would be at some point vulnerable because they would be interested to a topic. And then I go back to this uh, definition of uh, this, this, this comment on critical infrastructure that in fact is linked to a vulnerability profile, is that who is vulnerable depends a lot on the situation and the momentum. Now everyone that is in need to have access to healthcare system is by default vulnerable uh, population that needs to access a capability in which cyber is very strong. And as David was saying, you have the same idea when it comes to the delivery model of, uh, of, of foods and, um, and critical uh, commodities. Um, the threat landscape is, uh, again, nothing new there. It's just more intense. It just, uh, just got bigger because of internet penetration, because of the, massive, uh, of, the, of the massive scale of information that is circulating on, the, uh, on, this, um, on this crisis. And what we see is that both uh, criminal groups or state actors are using this uh, overdrive of information as a vector to conduct cyber operations. So you have the normally, I mean normal, the uh, well-known motive or financial gain for criminal groups to attack and infect. And then they use anything that is crafted COVID-19 to attract your attention, make you click, and then or make you make a mistake when it comes to cybersecurity or benefit from the fact, as Anastasia was saying, that there was no time to implement cybersecurity when suddenly we had to move from a business to home and this is abused. Or there's the also methodology that is known by state actors or actors that are very close to, um, to state interest to benefit from this very good ground of vulnerabilities that are exploited by criminals in order to facilitate and um, uh, obfuscate their, their attacks. So that's what we can see in terms of the, um, of the French landscape. And in fact, it also triggers another comment on my side, and I will close with that, is what about accountability? Because when the risk profile change and when the threat landscape is just increasing, uh, how do we make sure that at the end of the day, malicious actors are held accountable? 
it's it may be even more complicated now that uh, the type of attack are dispersed, escalating, and it's very difficult to get data out of it in order to analyze and make sure that um, there would be a framework and a potential to held malicious actor accountable. Maybe something we can uh, we can touch again for uh, what to do in the future. Thanks, Stefan. Uh, excellent outline. There were already some questions for basically for you, but I'll, I'll get back in a second on that one. Uh, so I, I uh, call on Andrea and my colleague who was following the chat closely uh, to just maybe try to sum up within a minute the open questions and, and the discussion track, basically. Andrea. Thank you for the floor, Vlada. Let me just check the new the two new messages uh, all right well uh, the chat started with uh, participants sharing some links on the newest updates regarding zoom security issues i won't go into detail on that but we will include those links in the summary of this webinar and then uh, one point i do believe from mr ko was about groceries and this of course caused some uh, comments uh, where uh, Pri said that the online delivery in Sri Lanka is not geared to cater to the demand. And uh, Sarah also noted that in developing countries, uh, um, online food shopping is still uh, lagging and she gave the example of uh, Africa. Uh, another comment on uh, Mr. Ko's um, keynote was, uh, on uh, risk profile and uh, complex choices around risk and security. Uh, Jovan Kurbalia underlined that that was key for him. Uh, Denise Demicoli said that uh, on vulnerabilities, recalibration of extending critical infrastructure to out office uh, environments will be important in the long term. And she also noted that encrypted, encrypted services are essential. Uh, we had one question, which is by uh, Adli Wahid. Uh, is there any proof that uh, state actors are exploiting uh, COVID-19? Uh, I do believe that, oh, excuse me, there is one more question that came in while I was talking. So Sharon Alexander uh, says, is COVID-19 amplifying a lot of cyber threats which are being overlooked, or is it opening our eyes to the challenges of online security? At this point, Vlad, I'll take the floor. Uh, I'll give you back the floor, sorry, and I expect you to give me the floor back uh, in 20-ish minutes for the second round of questions. Thank you. Thank you, Andriana, uh, and uh, quite some quite some interesting uh, reflections. I'll, I'll maybe start with this uh, pre-last question uh, on uh, whether we whether there are any sort of evidences, uh, evidences or um, firm beliefs that states are exploiting. We know what, what's happening in between the states. We've been following a lot on discussions, and Stefan, that's probably a question for you. Uh, but do we do we see any any particular well reliable proofs in a way that the states are uh, misusing or somehow using the COVID nineteen uh, situation for attacks one against another? And then I'll give a chance maybe to any one of you after after Stefan on any of the comments uh, that that you've heard, uh, Stefan. Yeah, thank you for this question. And I think you 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 put together the, the two more important words here: is evidence or belief. Um, when we look into what happened for the past uh, weeks uh, with the specific attacks and uh, the modus operandi and uh, the type of targets uh, from which we can derive some part of intent and the accessible data when it comes to the, uh, to the analysis of these attacks, you could see actors that have um, intent that are, that are linked to, um, to a political interest of specific countries. Uh, that were using a COVID-19 um, generated campaign. So uh, impersonating uh, Ministry of Health of country A in order to send uh, information to, uh, to its wider citizen. Um, so we saw that in, uh, in the context of uh, um, campaign that was sent to, uh, towards uh, Ukraine, the campaign that was sent, uh, that was sent in um, in, uh, in India, towards India, India's interest. So the modus operandi is similar to one that has been observed in the past and that's how today this uh, analysis are working. We look into what has happened in the past. There's some data that uh, cyber security experts are leveraging. And from that, we make an assumption that it looks like because of this modus operandi, this actor was attacking that country. Um, 
I go back to the keyword evidence. Uh, it's more than time that we look into how having a evidence-led framework to put these uh, yeah, beliefs towards more evidence. Um, some evidence today are scattered, depending on who is working on these kind of cases. So in between uh, cybersecurity uh, experts or um, entities that are close to governments that are leveraging this data, but most, most um, in the most of the cases, the, the analysis are just closed into the, um, the, 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 the security uh, and intelligence framework. So what we want to achieve in the Cyber Peace Institute is leverage a, co a coalition of partners to make sure that these data are gathered, analyzed, when the methodology is transparent to everyone, and that then the knowledge can be given to uh, yeah, the, the wider public in terms of what do we really know about this attack and what can we derive as uh, factual and evidence-led knowledge. Thanks, Stefan. And I guess the other question was uh, whether whether this crisis actually amplifies the risks or or it just makes us more aware. It's also quite linked to the data and to following what are what are the trends when it comes to data. So data is really important about all of that. Uh, before I move to the to the second set of questions, the second block on uh, what are we doing today? Uh, question: for, I mean, does any one of you want to um, to reflect briefly or on any of the points you just raised the hand? David, Serge, um, Anastasia, Serge. So <clears throat> I think this is a really interesting question. I think there is, you know, doing a proper analysis of an incident does take some time. And most of the experts right now are really busy in kind of coping with the new, with the new situation. And that is in terms of uh, identifying the new targets, looking, locking in and see what can we do, what needs to be done. But also on a really personal level, actually also getting adjust to start working at home. I mean, some people do this for a long time, but a lot of people now have a, a private environment that, that's very, very different, even in the instance response community. So that is a challenge. But having said that, I think there is no reason not to assume that a state actor would not profit from the current situation. And what, we, what a lot of attackers are, and that's kind of contrary to how Hollywood paints them, they're very good with emotions. They know how to play the emotions. In, in Hollywood movies, they're all, always the cold-hearted bad guys. But in reality, these are people that know how to manipulate people. They can read emotions. They can manage them, juggle them. And that's true for criminals as well as state actors. And I think that's where they profit. There's quotes in the internet from the internet on the ground where, where people have been overheard saying, hey, this is a great opportunity. Let's profit here as long as this goes on. And I mean, these people are really good at that. And then, of course, there's a secondary thing. And that's what Anastasia said in, in her her contribution, there's all the privacy concerns. Maybe this exceptional situation where rents, certain kind of a relaxation of privacy rules that you start tracking people through their mobile phones and stuff like that. But of course, there's the fear that once you tasted this, it's gonna, it's gonna stay and, and states now take this and move into a, start establishing technologies and practices that they want to abolish afterwards. And I really agree here with uh, Anastasia. This is, is a matter of concern that, that while extreme measures may be oriented right now, we also really have to make sure they go away after the crisis is over. And that is something that certainly holds for state actors. Thanks, Sergeant. We'll get back to that in the, in the last uh, bit of the, of the webinar on, on what comes after. Uh, now, but I, I, I think it's quite important that you un again underlined in a way the social engineering aspect and the human vulnerability of the whole uh, system. David, uh, you wanted to intervene. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Vlada. Um, I wanted to address the uh, question that came out about uh, whether um, these are new attacks. And uh, our own experience is that these are not fundamentally uh, new attacks. These are very uh, similar to the types of attacks that we have seen previously. It's just that people are using, uh, criminals are using the uh, COVID-19 situation and as uh, what Stefan was saying, the, um, the, uh, the emotions uh, that are associated with this and uh, just picking on that. So the kinds of attacks that we see are mostly phishing, social engineering, and um, actually e-commerce scams uh, because of the fear uh, of uh, shortages that, um, that uh, grip people. Um, uh, for example, shortages of masks in some cases or hand sanitizer, then 
um, there's an opportunity for uh, unscrupulous criminals to offer these for sale and then they take the, uh, down, the um, down payment or deposit and then they disappear. And there have been many cases of this uh, in my country. Um, and uh, I want to go back to a point uh, which was made earlier about the human factor. I could not agree more that in uh, most cases of cybersecurity, the human factor is really the weakest link. And in this situation, I see this amplified uh, on two counts. Firstly, more humans are involved. Typically in the past, many people who were not so active online uh, for whatever reason, uh, now have moved online. And now they perhaps uh, lack some of the instincts or familiarity with the uh, online space and they're falling victim. The second aspect of the human dimension is that people have moved out of the office into the home environment. The office environment, the enterprise environment is a much more controlled environment uh, compared to the home. In the home, you have most control over your own devices, how you connect. And again, this uh, lack of familiarity or lack of the awareness of the control measures which are necessary is opening people up to more uh, risks. So I just thought I'd share this perspective. Thank you. Good David, and in the, in the chat, there was an uh, interesting comment related to that, that we are actually getting out of the offices and also taking out the data. So the data is not anymore in the central place, it's scattered all around on our devices. There is a lot of more vulnerability in between, and we, we notice also the attacks on the VPNs uh, around the world. Um, moving on to the second block, and then I'll, I'll also uh, move back to Anastasia, uh, is basically, so we know that the, the whole approach to cybersecurity should be a multi-stakeholder one in a way and public-private partnership with each of these sectors having their own uh, role. Uh, so I wonder in this, in this current crisis, um, what, is, what are different sectors doing? And we've heard a, a little bit already from Serge on, on the certs uh, and from Stefan on, on, on this work on uh, trying to get more data about, about what's happening with the attacks. But usually the private sector is the one which is considered to be the first line of defense when it comes to cybersecurity. Uh, and I know there were a lot of reports from, uh, from various companies on trying to provide some, some additional level of support. So Anastasia, um, I know that the Kaspersky was also active in that and you probably know more about the, uh, how security sector and, and companies generally, not only security sector, but companies generally are trying to address these uh, vulnerabilities, threats, and so on. And what are, what are the particular examples that we can make um, as a good gesture uh, that there is some good response? Anastasia. Um, thanks a lot for this question. Um, but before, I have to probably, again, highlight that the COVID-19 agenda um, not made us realize that the healthcare sector is incredibly vulnerable uh, and the critical infrastructure is incredibly vulnerable. It is. It was before, actually. What COVID-19 agenda uh, helps us, again, realize that there are huge problems in that uh, sectors. First of all, because of the a lot of outdated software used in those critical sectors and in healthcare sectors, um, poorly designed and poorly secured IT devices that are used there as well. And um, there are a lot of the positive moment uh, among all of this chaos and a really challenging times is to see how different actors in the community are, co are coming forward with different innovative solutions to tackle different parts of this problem. So I would say that it's really great to see that everyone recognizes that time is a critical asset. And the key directions, are, I believe, that have the most potential to slightly or greatly significantly improve the situation are the increased public-private exchange of threat information, the increased and enhanced collaboration between public and private uh, actors, including training courses, including cybercrime investigations, and specifically targeting healthcare sector. I believe in the potential of uh, different task forces to identify best practices, lessons learned, and actually um, particular actions, how to reduce the vulnerability in this sector. And again, learning courses, trainings have always been and should be on the agenda uh, too, because many ICT incidents still, they occur because of the full uh, cyber hygiene and the lack of awareness and the knowledge. Um, what, Kasper, what we are trying to do, given our resources, even uh, because we believe that even if you are another doctor, you could still say make a contribution to the problem and help actually to people that suffer from the disease. 
um, we launched a, a free six month offer to medical institutions and hospitals around the globe uh, for a Kaspersky cybersecurity protection. And at this moment, uh, it's, it's really great to see that it, it is helping. It has, uh, may have an impact to help actually uh, institutions that are in a big, big pressure these days. So we received more than 600 requests from different countries around the globe. Uh, and I'm really happy to, to help with this. Um, speaking about other directions, what Kaspersky could do, um, trainings I mentioned. So we, we've always done this and we're trying to, to especially to help with trainings and sharing with the cyber threat data to support search, C search and law enforcement community at large. And I could just make a particular example. Uh, we are trying to help intergovernmental law enforcement organizations like Interpol and Europol. So I believe this is a, those directions that are really important these days in terms of this cyber security. Thank you, Anastasia. Um, I know Stefan, Stefan wanted to jump in. Thank you. Uh, just yeah, quickly, because the, um, something that uh, was just mentioned by Anastasia, very interesting in terms of sort of the new model of deliveries and why it's creating new, uh, new uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, you had uh, sectors like the health sector uh, where uh, there was a certain capacity to be good in terms of cybersecurity, cybersecurity hygiene at a certain level. Good. Now you have a wider supply chain that is heavily disrupted. So you have entities that today need to scale up very fast their capacity to deliver, for example, respirators or masks or whatever. So this uh, increases their vulnerabilities because they need to uh, deliver faster uh, something for which they, they, they create new interface with uh, entities that can have different security profiles. That's one. The second is entities or uh, industries, so private sector, to go back to your question, that suddenly are diverting their uh, production model and are starting to produce something that gets closer to critical infrastructure. Is there a cyber security level at, uh, at the required level to be seen? And the third one, Anastasia mentioned this, is um, very good crowdsourcing of collective intelligence, people that want to help. So you have hackathons like every day, uh, apps that are designed, people that are getting with innovative solutions, for example, to 3D print part of respirators. What is the security by design here? And again, that's what David was saying in the very beginning. Uh, where are we with the appetite for the risk profile. And um, I also saw that there was a question in terms of uh, best practices in this case and to build on uh, something that David was saying. Uh, you could look into the uh, coalition that the Global Cyber Alliance uh, created and we are part of it, the Cyber Peace Institute, for a program to secure um, everyone's capacity to work from home. Is this kind of actionable tools that could be leaked, looked into by everyone when you want to secure yourself a bit more and uh, because suddenly your risk profile is just changed. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. I think you both uh, raised a number of important aspects from, from education to uh, uh, information sharing to the uh, product security, basically, and this uh, uh, implementation of standards in the early phase. And there is a, there is a, a, a big uh, sort of platform, a dialogue project uh, led by the Swiss government where Diplo is involved, the uh, Geneva Dialogue on Responsible Behavior in Cyberspace, where we actually focus this year on product security and how do we make sure that the products that we get out of the industry are secure enough, follow standards and so on, and, and Kaspersky is also part of that. Uh, but one interesting aspect that we also raised uh, last, when we were preparing for the webinar, uh, was we have a lot of newcomers. So if we, if we look at an industry like Kaspersky, Microsoft, the industry which is established, um, they have, you have resources, you have uh, um, even funds, if you wish, and time and people to invest in helping others, and of course, in, in making sure that your products are secured to the best possible level. But companies like Zoom, which simply emerged and suddenly overnight got uh, 10 times or 20 times more um, um, users, they haven't embedded this in, from the outset, and now they have to cope. Now, Zoom is responding fairly, as, as Serge said, but we might have more and more of these uh, services which are popping up, suddenly becoming critical uh, for communications, for, for uh, grocery stores or whatever, uh, but they might uh, intrinsically have securities. So is there any sort of, um, um, as a food for thought, any recommendation? How do we make sure that we bring new small businesses like uh, startups even to embed this security by design, uh, security by default and all of that from the outset so that they don't have to patch afterwards and so on? Any, any quick comment by any one of you? 
Uh, let me take this. Sure. This is a, a real challenge, and that's it's not a new challenge to to this crisis. Uh, within first, where we bring together the security response teams, like the, the people that really are hired to to look into security incidents, we find it very hard to track startup companies. A lot of startup companies, they're they're kind of in their they're saying, we have a great idea, let's push it forward. And they do this, they become successful. And at some stage, they become really big sometimes. And then they, they have the problems. That's really kind of the textbook example is, is Zoom. They just run into that. And it would be nice if we can get these people in there. And, and, but right now, we just don't really know. Now, on the, the bright side, uh, right now, there's two kind of industry-led volunteer groups that kind of reasonably spontaneously formed on, on Slack that try to reach out to affect the party saying, hey, you're a hospital and you have problems, we help you, we share information. And I just checked this, like there's, there's over 3,000 members from private industry mostly, but also law enforcement and, and government certs in there that, that share information that now put aside kind of their competition and say, hey, this is a crisis where we have to work together and where we have to support people. And if you, if you have a problem as a, a participant, reach out and they'll try to help you. I find this very encouraging. And, and I think, and this already kind of leaks a bit into the next section. With a bit of luck, we come out of this having forged a lot of new relationships and a lot more understanding of why certain security practices are important, why it's important to actually talk to other experienced people so you don't make the same mistakes over and over again. So maybe this crisis can even be a chance of actually uh, making, improving the ecosystem a lot more. I mean, David said, we don't really see many more really new attacks. And I, I would subscribe to that view. We don't really see this. But what we see is a, a heightened attention to, to certainly all these risks. And so essentially what we get from COVID is a free awareness campaign. And I think there's a bit of luck we actually coming out of this crisis in a lot better position than we actually went in. And right now, fortunately, we haven't really seen kind of the cyber or Magadon in terms of security. So I think there's a lot of positive things really going on. And then maybe we should launch the Journal of Good News or something, because there is good news. Sergeant, you, you did a, an excellent uh, sort of uh, intro into, David, I'll, I'll get back to you, uh, in, uh, into the sort of a closing part of that. Uh, and uh, um, th there is some sort of a unity that you can uh, uh, notice. Uh, we noticed uh, this tweet uh, of Miko Hipponen, the EF Secure, one of the lead cybersecurity professionals who, who basically threatened the ransomware guys to some extent uh, to stay away from the medical institutions and so on. Otherwise, he and, and the community will hunt them down. And it's interesting that the, there is a huge pile of responses from, uh, from security community basically down that this tweet uh, supporting, saying, we are in, uh, just let us know, we'll go there. Uh, and as you mentioned, I mean, this is just one example, obviously, but I guess there, is, um, there, there are good examples of, of uh, unity in a way. And I'll get back to this sort of what we can expect. But I wanted to hear briefly from uh, Andriana. We have maybe five, seven more minutes uh, from Andriana. A quick summary. And then I'll get back to you with your sort of a closing, hopefully optimistic uh, uh, thoughts and, and a small poll for the participants. But um, Andriana, first. Thank you for the floor, Vlada. First of all, we had concerns by remote workers uh, from companies who just introduced remote work to, due to Corona. Sarah and Philip both uh, expressed concern that these workers might be exposed. Um, and they wondered about the um, measures that the companies and those individuals themselves must now uh, take. Um, Eves asked about uh, tips to help develop an online uh, safety culture, noting that the trend is nothing valuable can be taken from us on the internet, so why take precautions? Uh, Sarah noted that uh, training uh, opportunities should be uh, organized uh, locally in order to uh, make sure that more people can attend them. And she also um, suggested that the pricing of secure devices should be revisited to make them more affordable to the masses. Uh, and user 001884 
uh, said that they had not seen any reported major inci incidents where a critical infrastructure of a country had been breached or compromised relative to the COVID-19 situation. I do believe that, Vlada, over to you. Thank you. Um, so we have a couple of more minutes to basically sum up with, uh, with what comes next. Uh, and uh, while we do that, basically look into a crystal ball in a way, uh, what comes after the, after the COVID is, is gone. Uh, and while I turn to, um, uh, to the participants to maybe try to tweet uh, the, the, the choice, whether we should be uh, optimist or pessimist, or pessimist, uh, I want to turn on the poll as well and see what is the, the, the temperature of the room, as, as some say, uh, when it comes to the, the future. So will the corona crisis uh, make cyberspace uh, more secure, less secure, or equally, well, insecure as, as you wish? And while uh, participants vote, uh, let me turn then to you. I know that David wanted to reflect briefly on the previous aspects. And maybe, David, you can also uh, provide your thought of what we can expect after the COVID. Try to be in a tweet form if you can. Thanks, David. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, I'd, I'd say three things about uh, post-COVID. Uh, the first one is that um, we have all tasted work from home. Um, in the process, we have become more uh, aware of uh, video conferencing. Uh, we've also taken data out of the office. Um, overall, we have taken greater risk. Um, after this, the question is whether we will recalibrate and uh, re-institute uh, some of the control measures, whether for privacy, whether for security, back into the workplace or we have fundamentally shifted. Uh, I hope that we will recalibrate, uh, recognize that there, there were greater uh, opportunities, but at the same time, we took greater risk. And when the dust settles, we have to recalibrate back to the appropriate level. The second point I want to make is that, um, just to uh, build on what Serge says, I think there is uh, going to be a huge increase in awareness. Cybersecurity has clearly gone mainstream. Um, and uh, hopefully from this, we will be able to build on this uh, awareness and then um, allow people to change behavior so that we become, I think, uh, much more digital natives and be aware um, instinctively of cyber hygiene and the steps that we need to take for cybersecurity. And the last point I want to pick up on is about um, the security of our devices. I think with the increased awareness, we have an opportunity to raise the level of uh, security. Uh, of the devices, IoT devices, for example. In Singapore, we are starting a, um, a cybersecurity labeling scheme because one of the challenges we recognize is that people aren't aware of uh, the differentiation between uh, products. Uh, but if you can put it simply across uh, one tick, two tick, three ticks, uh, one star, two star, three star, then people hopefully will move and gravitate towards the products which are more secure. Uh, I think there will be now an appetite for people to pay a little bit of a premium for the more secure product. So I hope on balance that uh, the future looks a bit brighter after the dust is settled. Thank you. Thank you, David. And the results of the poll uh, sort of confirmed that. Uh, Anastasia, your tweet, uh, optimistic, pessimistic? Um, I would say that I would be right on optimist as well. Uh, pandemic is obviously a stress test for everyone, but I believe that challenges will only make us eventually stronger and more experienced. And I also like to highlight what I've um, noticed during these days. The crisis has shown that many people, communities, different actors, including companies, um, are actually are ready to take initiative and are self-mobilized for keeping uh, cyberspace secure and, and actually to, 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 help in, to help people that suffer from the disease. Um, I would say that I do hope to see further strengthening of digital cooperation. I do hope to see um, greater synergy between different actors in the community. And make a particular reference, I, we, uh, me and my colleagues, we were really um, glad to see the improvement made at the UN level in the open-ended working group. For the first time in the pre-draft, there was inclusion of the institutional regular dialogue. Uh, to keep cyberspace uh, safe, open, stable, and secure. So I do believe that this is the direction that will help, uh, will has the biggest potential to make uh, really good improvements uh, at the global level, at the regional level, and at the local level as well. 
thanks, Anastasia, for, for joining the, the more optimist uh, side. Um, so, tweet style. I think there's two two main things for me. One is that I think we we may get, get out of this crisis realizing how how important it is that we work together as a community. It's like the multi-stakeholder approach you mentioned in your I think second second picture you showed that this is really the way to go and that multi-stakeholder really needs a lot more stakeholders than we have today. And I think we're going to get out of this crisis with a lot more friends and trusted relationships. And maybe the other thing is the recognition that it's not only tech people that, that are important, it's also people that can't do home office that are really important and that may. So I think that's realization that the last of the tech sector has lost and is maybe regaining. That's it for me. Thank you, Serge. Uh, Stefan. Yes, thank you. The um, yeah, finishing with the tweet format. Let's say first to uh, to learn from the past, to learn from what happened in uh, in the same field or other fields. Uh, you were speaking about the startups before, uh, a field that I know quite well in terms of uh, online abuse by a terrorist group of uh, digital platforms. There's a lot that's been learned there in terms of how to train small platform, how to mentor them, and how to bring them to a level where they can be resilient against massive attack on their platform. So there's a lot that can be learned there where industry can mentor industry or multi-stakeholder can mentor a new arrivant in the, uh, in the area, I'd say. Um, as Serge was saying, a coalition, multi-stakeholder approach for sure. Um, leveraging from what is already existing and trying to give something that is actionable. Uh, we launched this uh, series of uh, CyberPeace Lab with the CyberPeace Institute where we bring experts all together to deliver um, insights and tools in specific areas that are already impacted today. How to create accountability framework, how to make sure that uh, attackers are going to face consequences. What about the norms and regulation that we have in place? Do they fit? Is this normal that today it's almost safer to attack a healthcare uh, capacity in a time of war than in a time of peace? So looking into these problems and providing solutions. Um, Serge mentioned it, it's very important not to do anything today that is going to lead us to be in a permanent state of surveillance. And there's very good uh, initiative today to make sure that we can have systems that protect ourselves whilst respecting uh, strong data protection. And a tweet format, I would say we should never rely on the goodwill of attackers, never. Uh, people uh, from the attacking side saying that they're going to be super nice and not attack us, it's just not acceptable. So this crisis is for me a wake-up call for a wider community. We said it, vulnerability is coming from uh, people, but today people have just the knowledge that they need to protect themselves. And when they protect themselves, as in the real life, online, they protect others. So thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Stefan, and I'm, I'm glad we, we ended up with, in, a, in a very positive, um, optimistic, uh, or, um, well, reasonably optimistic uh, manner, including the participants who voted about 40% will be more secure, and about 37% will be equally uh, secure, so that's at least, uh, we won't be less secure, that's good. Uh, one of the things, as, as they say, don't waste the crisis, so at least what we can do is learn much from the crisis, you all mentioned that, I hope it won't be only the security professionals, but also the states, which will learn that now we have to go forward with some agreements. On, on Diplo side, of course, uh, what we can offer, always offer uh, is this uh, learning opportunity, the Digital Watch website with all the links on cybersecurity, the regular online course, and certainly the webinars which will come after this. Uh, there'll be a recording and a summary of this webinar public on the, on the Diplo's website uh, soon. Uh, and uh, well, there'll be some more webinars coming on, on these digital policy aspects in the next weeks and days, so stay tuned. Uh, and thank you again, Anastasia, David, uh, Serge, and Stefan, and all of you for joining us uh, today. E see you some next time. Bye-bye. Stay safe.